can see the change grid that's up on the screen right now. Yeah. Um, this is a pretty old version of it. This would go back to 2009 based on the date I put on it. And Since when did 2009 become old? Yeah, isn't it strange? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. God, 14 true, years period, ago. Isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, the world of my archives, you know, I'll go and I'll look up a diagram because I want to look at a change grid or a composite or whatever. And I go and I look it up and it's like, sometimes I see a document from the 1990s and I go like, wow, that's what the change grid looked like in the, in the 1990s um, and how the diagram itself has kind of evolved because, um, you know, if you try to put all the layers on it and all the reference lines for all the layers, it just becomes a, a jumble of lines going every lines. direction you can think of. So, um, you know, gets to be too much. So I thought, no, let's just kind of focus the composite on maybe the half a dozen or so um, layers that uh, we actually do find ourselves talking about during a debrief. But there's a lot of other layers. And so I thought this was interesting because do you see how on this particular diagram, you've got the levels of tension. You guys should all be pretty, pretty, you know, aware of what's going on with the levels of tension now. And you certainly have the four quadrants, outgrid, upgrid, ingrid, downgrid. So that's what this big plus in the middle is all about. Um, I think we've talked about the... Um, the energies, the energies are the orange line. So are you a driven driver, an analytical? Oh yeah, I remember distinctly talking about this. And so that's what the orange lines are for layers that divide humanity into 16 types. Um, I don't know that we've talked about the nine type. And here I'm showing it in those light green lines as the tic-tac-toe board. But uh, we usually look at it as um, wedges coming out. And that would be these white lines going all around. So I'm looking at it and wondering, did we, we must have gotten rid of that, of that um, nine blocker at some point. I don't know, there, you know, I know I'm babbling, but uh, there's so many different models that we've looked at and integrated over the years and their maps all take on um, similar, but nevertheless different kinds of, uh, kinds of configurations. Um, and yeah, and part of the challenge is that we believe that there should be a spot on the change grid that would be the home base for any specific human behavior, no matter how um, logical, illogical, heinous, whatever it might be. There's got to be a place on the change grid where we could say, yes, that behavior could happen here, here, here. Well, most models of human behavior don't get into the dark side of human behavior. They tend to stay more on the more upbeat, positive, descriptive, useful, particularly those that are used inside of business settings because they're more often than not trying to use a psychometric tool as a way to best position somebody inside of their company. Um, more rarely than that are the tools that are designed to actually help you select a really good candidate. But um, I can't think of all that many models that are inclusive of the dangers zones like we are. Uh, that being said, there are models that do a deep dive into each of these uh, danger zones and kind of ignore the healthy side of things. So uh, when you put them all together, you can get a very, very robust uh, diagram, but it does become a lot of just visual clutter at a certain point if, um, you know, if you don't have a what do I say, a reason to put a spotlight on one of those um, less frequently encountered layers. That was a lot of babbling. Did you guys find that interesting yeah. at all? I, <laughs> so. and I think it'd be really useful to to concentrate on the bad, the dark side, because yeah. you're surprised, you're you're fooled by the good side sometimes, or easily. You're right. You're, right. You're, you're absolutely right. And I think the reason why I started, go ahead, Jeff. Go ahead. No, no, that's I'm done. Yeah. Oh, so I was just going to say, I think that the like the reason why this model has these kind of negative elements featured um, as prominently as we do is because I was out there to to find to, you know to build a career as a trainer and a consultant. Trainers and consultants aren't hired to help to take care of the people that are in the middle. 
you know, the people inside of the green circle, that's not our audience. Although, you know, there's certain topics they would love to have and they are, they, they're generally open for learning, but usually a company is going to pay us money to take care of a problem. And those problems are upgrid, downgrid, ingrid, outgrid. They're not really in the middle. And so we needed to look at what are these kind of negative expressions and what are the early stages that lead to that negative expression that we can start to um, identify, do some sort of intervention if we need to, uh, regardless of what direction we're moving around. So for example, if you have a group of employees that become really good at what they do, but what they do remains rather consistent and predictable. So challenge remains, how about this? It might've started up there high, but by the time we get to the point I'm talking about, it's down here three, four, you know, five, that, that general range there. But they view their ability as being, you know, super solid, a nine, a 10, maybe even an 11. Some may maybe even think they've mastered what's going on. And so that pulls that corporate resource very far down grid. And it should not be at all surprising to, uh, to, I don't know, realize, acknowledge that the vast majority of the American workforce, and maybe we can generalize it to other places around the world, but the vast majority of them are not up in stress. They're down in apathy. They're down going through the motions, knowing what's expected of them, meeting minimum performance standards. You know, this is what they're kind of doing, autopiloting, just going through the motions. Yeah, there are. If it ain't broke, break, it comes in, right? Well, and that can very much. And that's this next little group of the people. Maybe they see a little bit more challenge because they don't want to sink down here. They don't want to do that. So they go, well, yeah, it's working fine. How can we make it work better? So these people are going, as Andre pointed out, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And this person says, well, break it and let's see if we can put it back together or break it and see if we can make it stronger, you know, find some way uh, to improve. But keep in mind that the person who has those thoughts down here in power apathy is more of that kind of, um, uh, what do we call it, reformer type. That's this, this wedge right here. They're the person who's saying like, yeah, you know, you really could improve things. Yeah, we really could look at this. Yeah, in fact, you know, here's blah, blah, blah. And they'll talk about it. And, you know, they'll, they'll try to put a bigger spotlight on it, get other people involved in dialogue around it. But I don't hear any doing to fix it. And so in order for the doing to begin, there has to be a little bit more challenge um, and, uh, and that. So we, I, I bring this up only to say that because... The squeaky wheel gets oiled. Uh, people pay attention to where they find their tension. The truth is that while the population of employees that are up in stress is certainly there, um, it is considerably smaller than the population of employees that are further downgrid, if not all the way downgrid. The job of good, solid leadership is to make sure that people always find their job challenging enough, stimulating enough in order to get them engaged. Keep in mind what's happening with engagement here. As you move further and further down grid, you leave um, that, that execution part and you enter the engagement kind of ring. And then you go lower. And even though at one point you were engaged, now you just have an intention. Yeah, I'll get back to that someday. Or yes, because delegation occurs here. Yes, yeah, someone really should get back to that someday. And then you move even further down. Great. Yeah, I'm fully aware, blah, blah, blah. I'm you know, not even having an intention anymore. And then I end up in um, hypo awareness where it's kind of like not even on my radar at all. If a company allows that to happen, something truly stupid has occurred because they've invested heavily in helping this individual achieve that level of ability uh, to even begin to feel like they could be down in power apathy or apathy. This is a reflection on the inadequacies in management skills, leadership skills, or perhaps it's really not so much about maybe they're in apathy about management and leadership skills, and maybe they too need to be moved further upgrade so that they in turn can bring their people back upgrade. So 
this is where all the resources tend to go and they're being squandered, but the squeaky wheel gets oiled and all these management people who could be spending time on the ongoing development and enrichment of their top performing, most trained and skilled people, uh, they instead say, oh no, we got to put the fire out. No, we got to solve this problem. No, we got to do that. So we end up with management teams and leadership teams in corporations uh, that are very much in a reactive mode, not even a responsive mode, but in fact, uh, as far as their majority of their employees are concerned, a rather, hmm, what can I say, <sighs> negligent? Um, yeah, maybe that's too strong of a word, but you get the idea. These people get no attention because they're not causing any tension. Um, thoughts about that? Or did I just go off on a tangent for no reason? <laughs> but see, isn't that where people think? Isn't that where people kind of are relaxed and think about what's going on? Yeah. And Right. And, you know, you're absolutely right. We would say that there is always a positive aspect of every location on the change grid. Usually when we're talking about the healthy expression of that thinking. And we last time around, I think we talked about artistic creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, if we didn't, we certainly can. But artistic creativity versus problem solving. Um, these are two very different situations that have both been labeled um, as a need for creativity, but there's a big difference between artistic creativity and that, and we talked about that. And so if you're thinking about, or if you're, if you're thinking about a group of those people who are thinking in that way, how can we really lock this in? How can we really benefit from this as part of our core knowledge moving forward? Again, analytical energy is pre predominant, but this person is still up there in Southern power where they might want to be forming processes, procedures, structured uh, thoughts, and then a little bit further down grid. Now they're in power apathy where they want to delegate it to processes, procedures, routines, software, apps, whatever those kinds of things that allow us to benefit from and continue doing uh, good things as time goes on. Uh, but if the thought is down here, where now they're kind of not even engaged at that level anymore, and now they're even further down, um, mm -hmm. leaving downgrade awareness and entering downgrade hypo awareness, or rather hypo awareness by definition is downgrade. Uh, but that kind of thinking is a little bit more like the you know, ho hum, you know, my mind wanders into something. Daydreaming occurs here on the change grid. Oh. So if that's the thinking you're talking about, then it's a little further downgrade. So if you guys can all kind of appreciate that everything that we talk about on the change grid exists on some sort of a continuum, uh, then we do get better and better at learning what these subtleties and nuances are as we just move one step up or out or down or in, you know, there are subtle differences, but those subtle differences can be very profound for our clients. And obviously, since this is the Oracle of the Self, profound for you guys as you learn more and apply more to what you're, what you're all about. Yeah. Good observation there. Um, okay, anywho, uh, I haven't even labeled this column. We're already a quarter of the way through it, so I don't <laughs> even bother. But uh, this is session 20 for those of you that are keeping track. So um, uh, what I wanted to do on uh, today's call is start a discussion about how you go about moving someone around on the change grid. So up to now, we've been talking about what particular locations mean, um, and you've learned enough about what specific locations mean that now I hope you guys can, can uh, start to determine ideal locations on the change grid for a particular behavior. So I've uh, got a few exercises to do to set this all up and then uh, we can apply it to whatever's you know, really happened in your whole world. So let me give you a really simple scenario. You wanna get your hair cut. And you want to get your hair cut and you want your hair cut to be of the style you want it to be. You want it to be done well and you want it to be done, you know, with uh, uh, in a reasonable time frame. All those things you want in a great haircut, put it all together. Customer service, the actual skill, the execution, the overall experience, ambiance, etc. Where do you believe your hairstylist would need to be on the change grid in order to give you the highest quality haircut in the most reasonable amount of time? In the center. Well, in the center, let's talk about the center of that. And so I want you guys, and I could certainly do this, but I want you guys to tell me what is the case in favor of the center and what is the case against the center? She's going to have ideas. She's going to listen to me. She's not going to be so, or he, sorry, yeah. the 
the hairdresser won't be um, selling the hairstyle of the week. Ah, okay. Or, or what she likes to do. All right. And so um, th now that would mean that, that that individual is holding a couple of perceptions about the situation that this client has brought to them, that you've brought to them, because they don't want to overrate or underrate the challenge. And you're right, they're asking you questions so that they better understand what it is that you're really looking for. As they're hearing what you're saying, now their perceived ability is coming into play. And at an ability of six, um, you know, remember that ability is made up of knowledge and skill and experience and the actual avail availability of core physical resources in that moment. So there's some, some factors that come into ability. It's not just can they cut your hair in the style you want. They believe at a six that they can cut hair, but they haven't heard enough about the style or whatever it is that's going on. So to meet you here on the change grid is an ideal place for that conversation to begin. Now, let's say that conversation has been had. Is this the best place for you to get the actual haircut that you want? No. Because it's a different out. activity. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Brian, where would you want to put it now? I, I say a little bit out and maybe up. A little bit out and a little bit up. Am I in the am I in the intention? No, well, maybe of, right at I, the the blue line. So I'm engaging right here. Right, right, right in the yeah. Right. That's so right. so that's it. Because up to here, you know, this is a good part. You you come in and you said hello. It's all starting in a good place. Well, now um you know that the you, you need as the client to help this person become more aware of what it is you want so that they can formulate some sort of an intention in their head some sort of process procedure what are they going to do what are they going to recommend so it's all being formulated right here on the change grid as they shift it out grid a little bit keep in mind they're still inside of the green circle but then it comes time for them to say well let's get started and so when they get started, now they're in engagement. So now I want you to think about this. I'm going to give you your choice of three different stylists. They are all in engagement, but one is in upgrade engagement. Tell me anything you can tell me about upgrade engagement. Anyone remember anything we talked about it? Action is needed. It's urgent. It's urgent. There's more of a sense of urgency. Absolutely. So this person has a has a bit more of a hurry going on. Keep in mind, they're an expressive driver. If we look at those orange reference lines, we can see this where they are an expressive driver. So they do want to make something happen. They're feeling a sense of urgency. Um, how does that impact your experience of having your hair done is that do you like that it's stimulating maybe it's upbeat you know more uh, party kind of music you know so you know this individual or this this whole facility is part of their engagement strategy could say no we take an upgrade uh, sort of a strategy more of an expressive kind of an energy added to the fact that we're there to get the work done so can you guys kind of feel what that core what sort of a salon and a stylist might be like yeah mm -hmm. yep yeah now, Move yourself down grid, and now let's go all the way down to, to uh, the, the down grid part of that same engagement thing. This individual is now an analytical, analytical driver, still a driver, they want to get it done. But for them, it's all about one word, and that word is precision. So they want to make sure that they take their time so that every movement of the hair is exactly right, so that everything they do is constantly being evaluated and factored in because they're trying to create for you not just a haircut, but something that is of such meticulous precision that it will probably, number one, last longer, but number two, will be very striking for whatever it is that you're trying to do event-wise. Okay, can you guys feel that that's a different vibe? This is a different salon. This is a different kind of music. This is a different kind of energy and approach to the to the simple thought of getting your hair done, right? Right. Yeah, it's more weird. exclusive. Well, it could be more exclusive only because I believe that this level of precision comes at a premium price tag. 
Mm -hmm. So, and what I'm thinking about is this may very well be the uh, the stylist that brides go to uh, to get everything done for that wedding day, you know, where not a hair can move because it's been so carefully structured and all that kind of stuff. Can you imagine if on your wedding day you want something very structured and traditional and, you know, stunning that no amount of wind is going to damage and you're having it by an expressive driver? Mm -hmm. All right, so this yeah. I'm checking in with you guys to know, can you feel that there is a difference between those two locations on the change grid and that these locations could give you a very different outcome than the yeah. one that you want? Yeah. But yeah. hair grows and I want to have fun. You hair grows and you want to have fun. And so here you are. You might say, hey, this is the stylus for me. I don't need this level of precision. I don't want this level of precision. I don't want to spend that kind of time at the I can't maintain I that. To pay for it. What's that? I don't have an interest in maintaining it. Right, 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 right. And so, uh, yeah, I don't want this. This is too much for me. Now, there, of course, is right smack dab in the middle. And this is the stylus or the salon that you go into. And hey, it's very positive, but it's not over the top of the club atmosphere. And the people seem to all be very engaged and, uh, you know, creative kind of thing. But it, it doesn't look like I'm in some sort of counterculture kind of space where <laughs> everyone is all overdone. You know, this is a very clean, um, uh, not necessarily formal, but let's just say professional kind of an environment that attracts stylists that have elements of both this upgrade energy and this downgrade precision. So these are the three different salons you get to go to. Which one do you want to go to? I might now, I, I did that on purpose, and you guys can certainly answer if you want, because I was more interested in the fact that you all had paused before that you had all answered. Because pausing tells me that you have stopped from for a moment to go, there is a difference. What do I really want? And where am I trying to be on the change grid? Does this make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, now- If you just want it done, you know, you're not looking for, um, uh, you know, a boutique experience. I haven't cut my hair. I haven't needed a haircut in so long. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like strange even head, talk so. about exactly because now they do it in a package. Is from what I understand, yeah, yeah, and there's yeah. like all kinds of nonsense. But if you're just looking to get it done, it just might be outgrid. But if you're looking for an experience with it, you right. know, like the shape or that kind of thing, a certain um, atmosphere like I would never go to a place where there's like cigarette smoke or something like that yeah, I yeah, just yeah, 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 yeah right you want the environment that you really want and that's going right. to depend on where you are um, there is a great uh, barbershop a true barbershop uh, in the Charlotte area of North Carolina that was a combination um uh, I want to say scotch bar, but they sold anything that was like scotches, those kinds of liquors in an old, like Scottish kind of pub. It was called the, the Twisted Kilt. And uh, you could go in there and have yourself a top shelf glass of bourbon while you're getting your hair cut. Okay. So it was really kind of an interesting sort of a concept. And so uh, that was a little bit fun, but quite uh, still very formal, dignified, where if I go too far upgrade, if I go up here into power stress, whereas there is this sense of urgency, this uppermost, the expressive, expressive driver, these people are maybe in much more of a hurry than is going to serve you well. So sometimes, mm -hmm. um, although I've had haircuts at all kinds of places back when I actually had hair, um, I'm concerned that this is where supercuts might be doing their thing. Oh. Oh. Now, of course, it's going to be different based on who the stylist actually is. I mean, just because someone works at supercuts doesn't mean they're going to vibe with that whole supercut kind of speed. Look at the price they charge for a haircut. The only way they can make money is by having volume. And mm -hmm. volume is the it just says this. You got to go faster. It's the only variable we have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so you got to go faster, faster, faster. Well, that's definitely more of an upgrade kind of a thing. Where let's say that um, you were a stylist for a um, a fashion photographer, mm 
and you're doing a big fashion shoot this day. Well, on the one hand, you'd like that person to be analytical, to give you the kinds of styles they're really looking for. But do you believe that stylists in that environment get to take all the time they want? Or is there a time pressure? No, it's time pressure. There's time pressure. So they need to bring that expertise with them further upgrade. And maybe they need to be in power considering all the things they have to juggle because if they move too far upgrade, they're going to become, what do we say? The sense of urgency is going to be greater. They're going to become more impulsive. They're going to make the kinds of mistakes that being in a hurry leads to. But taking your time and making everything precision is not a luxury that they might uh, will be willing to put into the fashion show. Is this making sense? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so um, so we have to be, we have to really get good at saying like, where on the grid should something be? So now let's, let's uh, add something else to this mix. Um, before you made this decision, you had an, uh, an existing space on the change grid when it comes to you getting your hair cut or your hair styled. And you have to have, have that because you're all old and you've, you've had your hair cut. Where are you on the change grid right now when it comes to your hair maintenance routine, you know, your hair cutting routine, styling routine? Are you up in stress, power stress, power, power, apathy, or apathy? Let's start with that. <laughs> I'm in power. You're in power. Yeah, so the outgrid though, like I'm getting outgrid. it done. But even you know, it's interesting because even being bald, yep. people would presume like, oh, there's low maintenance oh. and that kind. Of, but no, I'm <laughs> much, very much high maintenance, right? I because know. I don't, I don't like little pricklies. Right. So, <laughs> so I have my routine where I go through every day. Yep. Like literally, and make sure it's shaved, and I can feel it, and I hate that rub. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. So I'm quite high maintenance. You're so you're out here about it now. I also have a shaved head, but I don't have this this feeling that it has to be a chrome dome every single moment. And so I may very well only shave my head if we're going somewhere where we're going to be around. And I, you know, I want to really look my best. So that's what, uh, so I'm not up here. I'm much further down grid. I'm okay at a zero guard uh, to maintain it, just a quick, quick buzz to get the worst off. But if I want to be looking good, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and I'll put the energy into getting it done. And so I'm much more down grid, maybe even in intention because it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to do it unless I have a reason to do it, to move me up into engagement. And Chris just chatted over here. He, he agrees. He's at 99% bald head. It's a daily thing because of virtual training. You're right. You need to, to look consistent on camera. Well, can you can you think of a good reason why T has not been on camera during this <laughs> period? <laughs> I'm wearing a t-shirt, you know? I mean, I'm doing my thing. And I know that for certain YouTube videos, I've got to be on camera. And on those recording days, you got to believe, I got to do the whole thing. I need that groom who's down here as the analytical driver because um, if you're going to make a series of videos that all need to feel like one single family of videos think about all the variables you have to control in order to make sure that today's videos will match tomorrow's and the day after that when it comes to sound quality the the whole miking part of things the lighting part of things the attire you, you guys with me on this um, you need that precision if you want to have continuity from one shooting day to the next um, and I, of course, think, okay, I've got to produce 26 videos. They're each seven minutes long. Well, that's only 150 some odd minutes. I can get that done in one day. <laughs> so I think I'm really kidding myself. And so I've got to make sure that everything appearance wise is going to match on subsequent days. And I got to make sure I have the same energy as I'm doing those videos. So it all feels like it belongs together. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, like Brian, all those little hairs show up on 4K video, particularly if you're being lit from above and oh. off, it off to the side. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So seeing that I use like I, I'm that nine nine, like Chris explained, because I use coconut oil. Like I take care of my scalp. All right. <laughs> like really <laughs> take care of it. And so if they use this certain light on the top 
it'll like you know shine on the dome yeah it's like, too glaring glare. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if they hit you with the light from the, the the center up but back you look like you have a glow a halo <laughs> so, exactly. exactly so anyway yeah you get the idea there's a reason why these people right here these analytical driver types have a value and why their value may actually be above and beyond those that are doing the high quality professional work and of course all the stuff that's happening more upgrade so the question again is, where are you guys on the grid when it comes to getting your hair cut? So anybody want to throw it out? So I know Brian's out here. Sounds like uh, Chris would be out here too, because they have to maintain it. Every single shower, they're going to do the quick, the quick touch up. I'm about 10, four. 10 and four, 10 and four. Okay, so that's right on the border. Uh, well, darn close to uh, where power apathy would leave. And so I will predict that you already have an established routine, maybe a, an established stylist. Uh, so tell us about your experience, T. I put it off as long as possible. All right. <laughs> um, and, and then she always says, how come you put it off as long as possible? I said, because I forget. Okay. <laughs> Um, I always wear, I wear hats a lot. And so, you know, if it looks good in a hat, that's fine with me. Um, you know, to have to take the time to go get it done yeah. is bothersome. Yep. And, right. um, but there's times I just have to finally get it done because it looks so bad. Right. And then you would choose whether you want to go to the the fun one, the professional one, or the precision one, depending on what you, obviously you said, I'm going to go and get it done sooner or later. So something. Well, I always go to the same pe per person um, as long as I can. And so that'll probably be more power to power apathy. Yes. As far as the routine of making the appointment, going to the appointment, keep in mind, that's a different question than who do you want cutting your hair? So who I want cutting my hair could be here, here, or here. So we got to move you to the right place to find those. But you're absolutely right when it comes to making the appointment, going and seeing someone you've uh, seen before and, uh, you know, catching up and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it should be more of a relaxed experience. In fact, it might even be power apathy. It might even be here. Uh, we can get things done without being engaged. So think about that for a second. How many things do you get done on a day that you can legitimately say, well, I'm not really engaged in doing it, but I'm out on errands and it's right there. And so we do a lot of stuff on more autopilot or more routinely. And to say that we're engaged just isn't really correct because although we are doing some stuff, the engagement implies that we are stimulated by it in some way or another. You know, there is enough challenge for it to capture our attention uh, or to get it done. Now, if you said to me, yeah, but I got to get all these errands done by two o'clock, that's a different activity. That's playing beat the clock, beat the clock no, means you got to move up grid and you got to do uh, maybe a little bit of outgrade to keep the, you know, keep the fire under the feet and moving. All right. So uh, very activity specific, but you could, you may very well go and get your haircut uh, just simply down here. I promise you when the guys are shaving their heads every single day, it's oh not like God. they're out here. They're in the routine act of doing what they do, you know, in, in the morning. So were they here initially? Yeah. The habit had to be formed, but once the habit was formed and it just kept getting exercised and repeated over and over and over, um, it becomes nothing more than a routine. And at a certain point, autopilot. Mm -hmm. So no, well, whoever. Yep. God bless him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think there's a reason I'm not a male with bald head. Yeah, well, and I'll, and I'll tell you that every time I finally do have to shave my head, uh, because the hair is longer, it's much more work. And I always am saying to myself, why don't I just do this while I'm in the shower every day? exactly but the That's behavior exactly. has not changed so according to our work on the threshold of activation truth be told i do not find my current situation troublesome enough to bother doing anything definitive to change it and but you look wonderful what's that <laughs> And you look wonderful. Well, and that's my thought. It's kind of like, I don't think I'm hideous. Um, or anything <laughs> like well, that. There's a big leap from what I said. When I had, when I had hair, um, I would even color my hair because I went gray when I was in my 20s. Uh, so I would, I would color my hair. Uh, and I always said when it was done, I think I look six months younger. It's not like it's making, <laughs> it's 
<laughs> any big difference, you know? <laughs> yeah, six months younger. All right. Anyway, so see, see, I'm, I'm, I think I'm ten nine, but um, I would share some of the comments that Brian made. I too am bald. Yep. Um, and but the interesting thing I was thinking of this as you were just speaking is that the frequency of, of which it gets done yeah. is much higher now than it was when I did go to a barber. Mm. Well, that's true. I think that that's probably uh, just on the practical side of things when you mm -hmm. when you see what you're actually asking the barber to do. And I'll I'll tell you guys that there's a barber shop that I like to go to uh, when I'm in when I'm in California when I'm in Palm Springs, and they are very much a gentleman's barber shop, and they do precision cut things with straight edge razors, and you know mm -hmm. you want something actually cut into your hair, some design or whatever. They they're the people you would go to. But if all you want is what they call the Telly Savalas. You walk <laughs> yeah. in and say, I want the Telly Savalas. It's $50 for them to just shave your head with a straight edge. And yeah, it's about as slick as it's going to get. But how often are you going to be willing to drop 50 bucks to have someone who knows what they're doing with a straight edge, you know, give you a Telly Savalas? It's just not practical. I just feel really sad that none of you know the freedom and the gift of the ponytail. Oh, you know, <laughs> I just couldn't rock that look. I don't think I could grow that hair, first of all, enough to do it. Uh, but uh, yeah, there you go. But uh, yeah, maybe David. David, do you have a ponytail? <laughs> Tom, do you have a ponytail? No. Anyone ever he rock had, one? He had a tail at one point. Back oh, was it the yeah, a little <laughs> that's, a, that's a mullet. That's what the no, mullet. No, no, no. No, this just was a tail. A, it was a just about section of hair on the back of my head, maybe half an inch wide at the absolute most. And it went all the way down his back. Yeah. and it Really? Was, it yeah. was wound like, what do you call that? A like braid? a big tail. Like a braid. Oh, he braided yeah. it too, yeah. Yeah. Really? Well, well aren't, you, aren't you just a cultural puzzle? <laughs> just That's fun. very I expressive. Yeah, about 1980 and cut it in 84, 83, 84. But I could tuck it under my shirt at the office and. Oh yeah. my gosh, a rebel, a rebel, a rebel. Yeah, I, see, I had know. dreads. I had dreads when I used to be a footballer or soccer is called the US. So yeah, I soccer. grew my hair long and um, I had dreads. My sister used to braid my hair. So I was very always this very particular about the aesthetics anyway in that well, way i i have a question for you on that i yes. would think they hurt and they itch exactly and so i lost when i shaved my head i was still in my 30s or so and i lost a bet to kids because i used to do a lot of work with kids and then once i shaved it it was kind of like took a week or so to get used to it and i was like this is so much better Right. So I always say I like, beat I, Mother I, Nature. Right, like like I don't have headaches anymore. Exactly. You know? I beat Mother I, Nature. So my yeah. sisters, you know, I have six sisters, and when I used to braid my hair, one was heavy handed. I used to wake up the next day with a headache. I said, Oh, this is the worst. It looks great, <laughs> but man, you like feel like my my head is pulled backwards. <laughs> Beauty is painful. Beauty is painful. <laughs> And she gave you a simultaneous uh, hairstyle and facelift. <laughs> exactly. exactly. I, I think all of our mothers used to go to bed in pearlers and oh, yeah. with a thing on their head. Right, right, right. A little, I thought yeah. you were going to say all of our mothers got their oh. aggression out by brushing our hair. No. <laughs> it's a little window into my soul. There you go. It's like, it's it's more about, about your life. <laughs> so, my mother used the back of her brush to whack me and my brothers. <laughs> oh yeah, and we all uh, turned out okay. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I, we we needed, especially me. Thank God. Shut me up, and my Dad did that. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, honest <laughs> to God, thank God they did that. Otherwise, I probably would have ended up. He'd like, still have that tail. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so again, you know, today's lesson is really about how do you move yourself around, but before you begin moving yourself around, you got to answer two questions. Where are you on the change grid and where would that particular activity uh, most likely turn out the way you want it to on the change grid? 
So two different locations, we got a starting point and, a, and an ending point, and we want to be literal about the points. So yeah, we can say we want to move up grid. That's fine. I can move you up grid. Oh, I want to move out grid. I can do that. I can move you up grid and out grid, but I want to be able to move you from coordinates 10, 3 up to coordinates, I don't know, how about 8 and 10? I want some precision in where my destinations happen to be. Now, for those of you that are first exposed to this Oracle of the Self, generalized maneuvers are very handy, very easy, and you can use them anywhere, anytime, on yourself, on somebody else. But if you really wanted to figure out the precision side of doing this tension management stuff, we get really fine tuned about where is that desired location? Why is that the desired location? And how exactly am I going to manage that individual, lead that individual, train that individual, or counsel that individual into uh, landing where I really want them to be? All right. So is this, this interesting? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so the context would matter in that regard, right? So are we Always. thinking like uh, in terms of those three E's that you described, is that how we're thinking about the movement? Like do we want to uh, do we yeah. or, you know, for yeah. moving someone, do they want to be efficient? It, do they it's want to interesting. Be it also, I think that, that uh, where they should be for that activity and where they are on the activity could be different. And I'm talking about the specific activity of choosing the course of action. You mentioned um, effective, efficient, elegant. And so um, if the only thing I care about is doing something effective, well, where on the change group would I be just to come up with something that's effective? You know, I could come up with something effective anywhere around this general vicinity, even a little bit of ability. I could still come up with something we could try that might work. You know, so if, if, the, if effective is the standard I'm going for, well, that gives me a much larger area of the change grid that would allow that to happen. If it's efficient, now what direction do I need to move for the ideal location? I'm favoring efficiency plus effectiveness over just effectiveness. So you're out grid now. I might be a little bit more out grid because obviously there's some sort of drive to do that. And what else? I'm trying to determine the most efficient way to get things done. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that involve reducing um, the perceived challenge? You're right, because I'm trying to do what? Reduce the challenge, increase ability, because I'm trying to do what? To make change. To make it more efficient. To make it more efficient. And efficiency has, and uh, Chris just chatted, chatted over here, time allocation, um, uh, a part of it. What I'm trying to do when it comes to efficiency is measure and make decisions based on those measurements of how long something is taking, how many steps are involved in getting it done, how many resources are required, level of expertise for the people that are involved. Expertise, or rather um, um, determining something that is efficient is a function of an analytical energy, right? The driver energy is just gonna push ahead and do it. The upgrade energy is gonna do it because they're, they feel that sense of urgency, that desperation, that stress, in order to just do something, try something. But it's that analytical energy that's going to make the person, um, or rather equip the person to make a decision about the efficiency of an option. And so now we just moved out and down a little bit over here. That's where we really, you know, right? An analytical driver, maybe, maybe a driven, uh, anal or, yeah, driven analytical somewhere around here would be good. But remember we said, no, my goal is not just effective. It's not just efficient. I want elegance. I want to find out the most uh, efficient way of doing things effectively. And that's what I'm going for. That's going to become our new procedure. That's going to be our new uh, performance standard. That's going to be our new brand, whatever it is. Um, where do I have to be on the change grid in order to determine what of the um, efficient options is most elegant. And again, elegance, the least resources required. Uh -huh. Where do you think? So I'm already out here at the analytical driver, but if you look at these four squares, this one that we see the green line crossing, 
we have to look at relative energy. So if I'm in the center of the, um, of the analytical driver quadrant, right there in the center, recognize that at the center of that square, I am not at any intersection. So to get to, to that tertiary energy, I have to lean a particular way. So maybe I'm going to lean a little more expressive, oh, yeah. a little upgrade. Maybe I'm just going to be a little bit more driven and lean this way. Maybe I'm going to be a little bit more caring and, and interested in how other people are thinking and feeling about it, in which case I would, uh, I would lean towards the amiable analytical driver area. Or am I going to move a down grid where I need even more emphasis placed on the analytical side of things? I need to be an analytical, analytical driver in order to really, really be able to determine the most effective option we have available to us. All right, now, would you agree with what, the destination I just I just put there? <laughs> I like Susan. Just find a competent hairstylist to make a standing appointment. <laughs> yeah. and, a ponytail and get moving. Yeah, and she so she's a little bit more down here, more procedural. The analytical energy is the first thing she said. Just find a competent hairstylist. The task of finding a hairstylist. Um, and then determining that that stylus is competent um, is something that requires almost the same energy I'm describing. It's mm -hmm. about you becoming very discerning, very much, uh, you know, wanting to make the right choice. And so hers is a little bit more downgrade than the one I was putting forward about true, finding that true elegant kind of one, which would be here. But Long story short, it would be an analytical, analytical driver energy is where we would target it. Now, if you want to be, don't want to be that precise about it, then yeah, you could say, well, look, I, I want, uh, I want something that's going to be as efficient as possible. So I'm going to move out grid a little bit and maybe a little bit down grid to look at some things. I'd be a happy guy if you just said, let's just choose this quad, this uh, little sub quadrant here, little region. So there's no hard and fast rules about, um, how you go about choosing desired locations or how precise you are. Honestly, more often than not, we will say, just move them up grid, just move them out grid, just move them down grid and not really do the, uh, the, 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 the thought work of figuring out precision, ideal locations, et cetera. That being said, if you're being hired as a consultant to make these definitive changes, uh, just letting them know that you have this capability uh, in your toolbox is something that's going to distinguish you from other consultants and letting them know that you are able to actually track performance along the way. So as we reintroduce the change grade activity list over and over again, we should be able to show the decision makers that the group, uh, the population has moved more into unity and is moving more and more in the direction we really want them to be. So we can actually prove return on investment if we are using the precision elements of the change grid. Was that too much for an oracle of the self-conversation? <laughs> oh, anyway, there you go. Um, so let's take a look at the, uh, the, the change grid maneuvers. And uh, I have a little PDF. And in fact, I thought I'd roll it over to you guys. Just a second. Composite, map, change grid maneuvers. Yeah, let me chat this over to everybody. Oop, one moment, everyone. So you have this if you'd like it. Uh, okay, change grid maneuvers. It is a PDF file. So there you go. You guys should all have it now in your chat windows. Um, okay, so uh, generally the change grid maneuvers are really uh, pretty straightforward sorts of things. But I want you to know the change grid maneuvers are not complete sets of things. So for example, if I said, I want you to be able to lower someone's level of tension. Now, if I remember correctly, we've already talked about these change grid maneuvers on an earlier call, am I correct? Yes. Yep. And so I just want to quickly review them to get to the one that's really the, the most important. So we can do these downgrade, oh, scratch that. We could do all kinds of things that will lower someone's level of tension. And remember the joke that is nevertheless true is you could administer drugs and alcohol and you can lower someone's level of tension. So there's lots of things that you could do, but a lot of the things we talked about would be uh, considered to be um, inappropriate, immoral, illegal, whatever. It's just not, not something that you would do. So our question is always, what can I do inside of a professional, conversational sort of, a, of an approach to lower someone's level of tension?
So if you're applying this oracle to self, it's how can I do these things for myself? How can I walk through these little thought processes to move myself downgrade if I'm trying to lower my tension or upgrade if I'm trying to raise my tension? So you can do this uh, self-apply or you can do this applying to others with or without their knowledge or consent, by the way. I can raise someone's level of tension without them knowing that I'm doing it. And I can lower someone's level of tension without them being aware that I'm consciously trying to do it. So we can do all these sorts of things. And by the way, we all do these sorts of things all the time without looking at it as kind of like a structured sort of a procedure that we're following. Uh, so remember that tension management was not invented. We simply noticed it. We learned about it. We compiled stuff from all kinds of sources. We did what the circle of brilliance does. We merged all that brilliance together. And we ended up with these sorts of things. So these are the kinds of things that we do with our clients to lower tension. These are the things we do to raise their tension. These are the things we do to increase their drive. Outgrid maneuvers increases drive. And these are the kinds of things that we do uh, in order to um, uh, reduce uh, or rather to um, soften them, to move them more in grid, make them increasing humility, et cetera. All right. So you guys remember all this, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Now, we're going to look at them in a little bit more uh, detail and have a little bit of a different label attached to them. And so there are four kinds of input that you can give somebody in the kind of work that we do. We uh, And often we are doing more than one of these things. And so think of it as a bunch of different hats that you can put on. And depending on the situation you're in, you might put on a different hat in order to accomplish a particular objective. Now, while we do say as a joke, but it's true that we don't have just four hats. We, we all have haberdashery shops in our head, you know? You've got the, well, the modiste or the milliner or whatever, you know, making all kinds of different hats. So um, don't think these are the, the only ones that you do. These are not the only roles that you play. But very often, uh, and this is something that comes out of pride-based leadership, we find that people are confusing what is leadership and what is management. And they've been doing it so, um, what do I want to say, so... Uh, so much of a focus on management, they've almost pushed the leadership skills off to the wayside, even though they still refer to what they're doing as leadership training. So we believe they are missing a very, very big point in the world of tension management. And as a result, the true skills of leadership have been uh, put aside and not focused upon, not truly trained uh, in uh, individuals that are now running organizations. And so uh, to put your curiosity to rest, there are four key skills of leadership. And those four uh, skills of leadership, wait, no, there's five. Um, anyway, they are, number one, a leader must have the ability to articulate a compelling vision. So think about that for a second. They're a leader. They're supposed to be in front of people in every form that they can take. And what they are uh, top of top of line on their shoulders is they need to be able to create to uh, to communicate a compelling vision to those individuals. That's where it all begins. If they can't do a good job in front of an audience, then their their leadership uh, success is going to crumble. I don't care what title you give them or how much money you pay them. So a leader has to be able to articulate a compelling vision. Uh, and communicate that to the audience that they're there. The second thing they have to be able to do is to awaken a desire within other people. So um, a leader is a leader, not because of who they are, but because of who you become when you were in that leader's presence. So the leader's job, again, is to articulate that compelling vision, but it's also to awaken desire in the hearts of all of those who hear the message. So a leader's job is to win people over to a way of thinking, capture their attention. Um, and so, um, yeah, so that's what they, they need to do. The third thing that they do is they create and sustain an environment of pride. 
they make sure that you feel as though you have something um, to offer, that you are of genuine value, that, that the vision and mission that they are talking about uh, is something that they see you being a part of. And so they, they want to uh, awaken that desire to come along and accomplish the things that you want to change. And the way they do that is by making sure that there is always an environment of pride, a place where you always feel good about who you are, what you're doing, and who you're doing it for. So they, they talk about the cause, they talk about the, uh, the outcome that they, they envision for everyone who's involved, and they are always telling you that it is because of you that that is possible. So, and again, as I'm going through these things, I want you to hear that there is a possibility that instead of all those things coming from a genuinely good heart space, they can also be done in a highly constructed way by someone whose interests are to simply manipulate you into doing something that they want you to do. So as I'm describing the skills of leadership, um, I would hope you're hearing more about the ethical application. But again, the change grid has a space on it for all the worst possibilities in human behavior. And among those possibilities are people that are trying to, exp to exploit uh, another part of the population. And so so you got to just kind of know that whether my intentions are noble or evil, I can still articulate a compelling vision and I can still awaken desire in your hearts and I can still create an environment where you're going to feel good about you. The fourth thing that I do as a leader is that I keep people focused on a single outcome, on a single task at hand, a single part of the mission. Um, now, I don't do the work itself. I rely upon all of you that I've just empowered through the first three, uh, stepping up to the plate into that leadership role yourself. I've been doing this so that you will in turn now turn and do the work and the volunteers, the army of people that my message has hopefully created. And so, but I got to keep you focused on the single outcome because if I let you guys go off on different tangents about what you think need to be done next or how you think it needs to be done next and blah, 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 I'm no longer leading. I was just the one that built a fire, a bunch of, of, of lead, you know, junior leaders that are creating their own leadership world. So I got to keep everybody focused on that singular outcome that we're all working to make happen. And then the last thing, number five, is that uh, a leadership skill is leaders have the ability to readily identify other natural leaders and uh, turn them into uh, whatever they really need. So they have the ability to, to, to quite literally recognize and develop leadership skills in uh, other, I'm gonna say worthy sorts of people. We can help anyone be a better leader, but as far as what the true leadership skill is, they aren't threatened by other leaders. They instead see those leadership capabilities and qualities and uh, personalities and nature, and they, they not only recognize it, but they embrace it and they develop that individual to become the best leader they can be. So what I've been rattling off there for the past few minutes, is that a different description of leadership that you guys have heard uh, in other things that have been done that you've been exposed to? Yeah, I, for me it is. I, I, well, in a way it is. I think there it's describing hierarchies that people are pushing back against. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, for, for instance, a lot of physicians who are quitting and nurses in droves at this current time, one of the main things is there's no autonomy. So they feel like they, you know, have no, uh, that, that self, you know, we're here talking about the Oracle yeah. self. They feel like that is MIA. And so, Oftentimes, there's this gap between NBA trained uh, uh, leaders mm -hmm. and cl and clinicians. So they make business decisions, oh. but they're asking, you know, clinicians to do and say things that aren't in the patient's best interest, and that goes mm -hmm. against the grain of what you're you're trained. Right. And so right. they push against that hierarchy, and that's when you start hearing. And I know you have. Uh, we talked about that before. That's where you hear this push for so-called self-leadership and these kinds of things mm -hmm. that, you know, creates more of a muck than what the hierarchies exactly. are creating. 
<laughs> exactly. Because if I have a hundred people that are all highly skilled leaders, but they're each leading their own objective, their own interpretation of the mission, et cetera, how does that affect um, my goal as the, you know, the supposed top leader? <laughs> well, is that helping me or harming me? You know, that's, yeah, that's definitely harming. Right. That's what you got to be looking out for. And even if my motive is whether it's noble or evil, I'm the one who's supposed to be leading whatever that project happens to be or whatever that company or whatever that initiative happens to be. That's the burden on my shoulders is to make sure that I'm doing all five of those things. And so the reason why I wanted to bring to your attention how we look at leadership and pride-based leadership, we look at it as a very specific skill set um, uh, that it makes it easier for people to see that things are not all about leadership. And so I want to go back up to the downgrade maneuvers. Now, yes, you could put on that leadership hat, but there is a different hat you're going to put on here. So let's say that when you put on your downgrid maneuver hat and you are helping whoever the individual is, which could be yourself as the case may be, and you are normalizing what's going on for them and you're simplifying what's going on and you're adding resources and restoring resources, you're doing all these kinds of things. Tell me what roles inside of a corporate uh, human development space might be uh, taking care of these objectives, these for performing these maneuvers as the bulk of their job. HR? Um, well, we would hope that HR is going to be doing some of these sorts of things, particularly if they're providing any counseling or et cetera. So it could be HR. Who else is the expertise? Supervisor. The, the what now? The supervisor. The supervisor, but I'm looking a little bit more for not what their job is, but what role are they playing? So when it comes to HR, HR might be serving as the label I'm looking for here. Uh, but as Brian pointed out, they might uh, be the uh, more of a counselor type as well. And we'll see where uh -huh. that forms into well. So I know we're at the top of the hour. So anyone else want to throw out uh, their thought? What are downgrade maneuvers? Whose domain uh, does downgrade maneuvers fall into? What Hmm. Okay, this is what I'm doing right now. Downgrid maneuvers are the domain of training, trainer. Hmm. When I'm a trainer, downgrid maneuvers, think about where someone whose upgrade is. They view their ability as being low or on the little low half, and they believe the challenge is in the upper half of things. What are these people missing? What they're missing is more ability. Uh, or you, to get that ability exercised so that the perceived challenge can come down. As the ability goes up, the perceived challenge goes down. I know I'm doing that with my hands in, in thin air right now, but uh, you guys could be able to envision that by this point in your, in your training. So, so the reason why it's a trainer is because that's what the people are lacking. They're lacking knowledge and skill and experience or core physical resources that need to be done. My job as a trainer is for you to recognize that what it is that you need to learn and why you need to learn it is really a rather common sort of a thing. And while it might have felt complex, we have simplified it. Here's a whole lot of resources for you. Here's the training. Here's the exercise. Here's five days worth of blah, blah, blah. Whatever those resources are, include the full content of the training program, as well as whatever physical resources you might leave behind them. And then restore resources. We always want to make sure that a training program builds Builds on what people already do well. And so throughout that training, we're saying, well, in all likelihood, you guys have done something like this before. Let's look at what you learned from there and reapply it. So we're restoring resources about what's going on. This is the domain of a trainer. Now imagine if we are in a situation where we need that leader, by the way, the leader would be these outgrid maneuvers. I'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, but uh, what, rather than wearing the leader hat that we need, what if this individual instead decides to put on the, um, the trainer hat? How effective do you think a leader is when their behavior is actually that of a trainer and vice versa? How effective do you think a trainer is if they carry themselves as a leader? Mm. Are you with me? These are two different situations that require two different approaches, two different sets of maneuvers. Well, it's a, 
Yep. It's how you relate to the person. If you are above them and preaching down, okay. they're mm -hmm. not going to take your, they're not going to be as, uh, as able to take what you're telling them as something yep. to you, something they can relate and they can relate to you where they can't really relate to a leader. A leader is telling them what to do and inciting them and move it, exactly. move it. Exactly. Doing it. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And um, by the way, if we go up, if we look upgrade for just a second, never forget that the upgrade danger zone is right next to the outgrade danger zone. And so that means that in times of crisis, someone might become very aggressive because they're neighbors, right? These energies are readily available. And so let's say, building on what Anja was sharing, let's say that the people that are in that training class need more of an intervention kind of a training because we got to get out there in the next hour and blah, blah, blah. You know, maybe this is more about a sports coach that's about to lose the game or whatever. They might come across as being highly directive in their training because they believe that matches the audience at that time. But let's say we have an audience that's really more in power stress. Well, now we might want to employ all the more participative kinds of, of things we do in training programs, make sure people are involved, take some time, let them learn what's really going on. Um, and so I'm between that green and that red circle, uh, anywhere right along here would be where training is going to occur. But if I go inside of the green circle, now what I am is I'm someone who's very much planning curricula. Uh, keep in mind, I'm an analytical expressive. There is still an analytical energy that's happening right here. But the primary one is that I am more of an expressive. I'm trying to connect. I'm trying to teach. I'm trying to deal with an upgrade issue, but I need to do it. And so this is where uh, my diplomacy might come out, um, et cetera. Where upgrade here, we might find some diplomacy, but that's because they're an amiable driver. They want to make that nice connection first. Uh, but your observation is correct. Um, if any of you came to the conclusion that training needs to be done through a training skill set and leadership needs to be done through a leadership skill set, we're good to go, right? Because a leadership skill set is not very effective in a training environment and a training <laughs> approach is not very effective in a leadership environment. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, thoughts about that? Is this making? Yeah, it's just good. good. Yeah. And again, why am I doing all this? I want you guys to appreciate. Well, first of all, I want you all to realize how much you actually know about this diagram in front of you. So over the course of 20 sessions, I'm hopefully you guys look at this and go, this is not just a bunch of lines going in every direction. We've talked about a lot of these lines and I know what's going on here and I can feel how different that is from over here. Now we're just trying to take that and after you've all kind of embraced it and own that and realize you really can very easily figure things out by applying these principles we've been talking about. Now we can say, all right, now make some choices. Where are you on the change grid as far as X is concerned? Where should you be on the change grid in order for that to happen most naturally? And how are we going to move you? We're going to move you because we're going to put together some set, some combination perhaps of these different maneuvers that we believe will be most powerful in getting you to where we really want to get you to, to go on there. And uh, then we're going to introduce the, the last set of them. Those are the PowerPoint maneuvers. How do you get to center? And so um, uh, if you guys are finding this interesting, I'll pick up where we left off next time around. Um, and, uh, you know, we're getting pretty much uh, to the close of what I consider to be basic sort of stuff. Uh, but I want to talk to you guys about what well, we're thinking about doing next specifically for you guys. Uh, so anyone who comes along when we start to market the Oracle of the Self, um, I'm not putting them through 20 hours of training. They, they're, they're there for a different reason. So we want to get back to what our official curriculum is. But for you guys, um, I have no problem at all talking about what I think might work next for us. Uh, so with that, any questions, comments, concerns? No, yeah, this has see, been fascinating. Yeah, great. I wonder great. if we could talk about, like, as you, you, you're talking about Oracle itself, right? So the trainer is in the downgrade maneuvers. A trainer can observe things, whereas it might be, it's tough uh, for you to be the you in you, an right. observe, and, and, observer, right? So you're doing this own kind of normalizing, simplifying, adding yeah, yeah. store resources yourself. 
Right. That's yeah. what I'm interested in. Yeah. Well, let, let me kind of explain where that's all going to fit in because you just asked a gifted student's question <laughs> that I imagined <laughs> would come up about four weeks from now. So here's the thing. This is where we're trying to go for the Oracle of the Self. As we've said umpteen times, and we'll say it many more times, you guys really want to develop the ability to move into the green circle and remain in the green circle for most of your time, most of your days. This is where you want to be, where you are really well uh, aware of what's going on in all the world around you, and you're being very selective about how you, you move things around. So um, I get it. Sometimes life situations require us to step further out, grid or up, grid or down, grid or any in between you want to choose in order to live life as we've labeled it up to now. Stuff happens and you got to respond. There's things out there, but you take care of whatever that was and you get back inside your green circle. So I would like to think that as you develop your skill set to get into the green circle, recognize when you're inside the green circle and stay in the green circle, you would realize that your actual usage of upgrade maneuvers is only designed to move you from the exact center up here. It's not designed to take you further out. You don't need to do that because you're living a very, uh, what do we say, well-balanced, well-centered, very empowered, uh, detached, uh, yet caring. We would say practicing the art of caring detachment. You are an expert at practicing the art of caring detachment. You still might need to move yourself up grid. That's fine. You still want to explore things that are out grid. That's fine. But we're not going to out grid maneuver ourselves all the way past that green line and into the red line. Sometimes that's necessary, but that's not what we want for our Oracle uh, outcome to be down grid. We don't want you to be down here in apathy. We want you to be here where that part of being down grid, that, lateral, that analytical energy serves you best. And you'll learn what maneuvers uh, are, are all involved there. And, uh, you know, so it's all the same thing. So where are we trying to move you down grid, up grid, in grid, out grid? Uh, it all depends. But for you guys, we want it all happening inside of the green circle. I promise you for uh, those of you that are working with corporate clients or doing individual coaching and training, you encounter plenty of situations that are between the green and the red line. And even once in a while, maybe more often than you care to, to deal with people that are in danger zones. So get the idea. So if yeah. I do professional training, you'd learn the whole thing. Uh, if you want to really focus on Oracle of the Self, we, we're going to touch on everything, but you got to focus on uh, that inside the green circle kind of world. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. If Excellent. everybody on the planet was just inside the green circle, do you have any idea how peaceful this place would be? Oh my God, yes. You know, th this is where we all need to be out here. It's just too much. It's too much energy being wasted or too much drive being too pushy and, and all that. And we don't need people that are downgrade, apathetic and lethargic. Again, this is situation specific. And we don't we don't need people to be to be too timid because guess who the people that are more outgrid and upgrid get to take care of? Actually, it's the people who are more outgrid. Guess who they end up having to take care of? of. They have to take care of the people that are upgrade. They need to be rescued. And here's where the talent is. And these people need to be encouraged. And here's where that talent is. And these people need to have uh, a mission and uh, reawakened in them and joy. And that's who's out here. So the job of leadership in order to keep the world in this, in this kind of um, what do I say? Um, it's don't don't think of it as bliss. Bliss should be in the exact center, and I don't think that's practical. But this is a very cooperative, understanding, supportive, um, all all those positive things we're looking for. It happens here, but somebody's got to be the leader of it, and that leader's going to be a bit further out grid because uh, they got to move all the rest of these people. Uh, that's that's the burden of being the leader. If you're a good leader, you get the idea. You know what I'm saying? It's like there is a negative expression, but. We don't need to keep dwelling on that. We can look at the positive aspect of things. Right. Um, uh, yes, Tim, we certainly can. So feel free to hang around. Um, all right. Uh, anything else? Anybody else before we're done? No. no. Nope. All right. Well, then digest on all that. And we'll talk again very soon. So bye, everybody. Thanks. Take care. Bye. 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 bye.